uh, open up and explore the Book of Romans. This is uh, much anticipated, at least it is for me, uh, as I have studied out this book. Uh, God has really laid on my heart some things. There is an outline uh, that you can follow along in your outline. And uh, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we will get into our book. Amen? Amen. Father, Lord, we are very grateful to you. Lord, I thank you that, first and foremost, you sent your son, who died on a cross, when it was my sin debt to pay, he paid my debt for me. Yeah. And Lord, by doing so, opened the door for me to trust you as Lord and Savior and to receive eternal life. And Lord, I'm grateful that that opportunity was given to me and that I took the challenge. And Lord, I am so grateful that I now have the Holy Spirit of God living in me. Yeah. Yes dwelling in me, sealed in me. And Lord, my prayer is that in my own personal life, as well as in the lives of the people that are here today, I pray that your word would continue to challenge us, that it would continue to guide us, Lord, and to be the very thing that we have and that we use in our lives that would guide our everyday walk. And Lord, I'm grateful for this church. I'm grateful for the people that are here. Lord, I pray that you would continue to knit our hearts together, knowing that you have given the church as the, as the very people that you are using to demonstrate the very power of God. Lord, I pray that we would demonstrate that in every aspect of our lives. So Lord, open our hearts and open our minds to that. Lord, help me to proclaim your word in a very clear manner. And I pray that he that hath ears to hear would hear today. Specifically in their own personal life, what you have to say to them. And I pray that these words will minister to their heart. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we begin our study, in the first chapter of Paul's epistle or Paul's letter to the Romans. It's important that I give to you a picture of the setting in which the epistle was written. Paul, who at this time never had been to Rome when he wrote this letter, but he begins the letter with a brief description of himself and his special status in the church. Now because of this, Although Paul clearly had friends in the church in Rome, to most he was a stranger. So he gives instructions to the church and a picture of himself and his relationship to the Lord and to them. And we get a glimpse of the major theme of this letter being the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he begins with a salutation. And we find that in that salutation will take us to the first four verses of Romans, which we will study today. And he starts by giving a mandate of the gospel, and speaking of himself, he calls himself a servant. He says in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. The Paul begins with a statement concerning himself that was clearly one of Paul's favorite terminologies that he liked to use uh, in opening him, his letters. He opens Philippians this way, he opens Titus this way, and then when you read the writings of James, Peter, and Jude in 2 Peter, and then what John writes in Revelation, they all begin their, their letters in that way as well. Paul, though, as an apostle, like all the other apostles, were ministers, they were servants to Jesus Christ, and they were servants also to the body of Christ itself. <clears throat> now, Paul designates himself a servant. Literally, what does he mean by that? 
He means that he was a bondman for Jesus Christ. He does not mean, however, that he was a servant of, in bondage, but rather the wholehearted obedience of one who realized that he had been bought with a price. He understood that. Now, in the Greek text, the word that the apostle uses here, that the apostle uses here, is a word called dolos, spelled D-O-U-L-O-S, which is not primarily translated servant, but a servant in the ancient world, and you need to understand this because there's a difference between what a servant was in the ancient world and what Paul is now calling a servant. A servant in the ancient world was a person who could come and go at will, who could resign from one job and then seek employment elsewhere if he so inclined. This is the way that servanthood worked in ancient Rome. But Dolos was a slave that was owned by what's called a kyrios in Greek, or a master or a lord. Now frequently in the New Testament, this type of imagery is used to portray, watch this, the relationship between Christ and his people. He is our Lord, he is our master, and we are his servants. <coughs> that is what he has called us to be. You and I are not our own. The scripture says that we are bought with a price. And when you look at the very price that, we were, that was paid for our sin, we were bought with the very price of the very blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. A hefty price was paid that we then now can be called servants of the Lord. We are called to be servants. He is our master. And there was a price that was paid for us to even have that opportunity. Now Paul will explain in the book of Romans that man, outside of Christ, watch this, is a slave. Amen. The problem is that enslaved, he is enslaved to the bondage of sin. So here's the reality. When you look at it from that perspective, all men are in bondage. You are either in bondage to sin, or you are in bondage to the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ being your master. But all of us are in bondage. The question is, who are you in bondage to? not whether or not you, in fact, are in bondage. A lost man is in bondage to sin, and here's the problem. He is a slave to his own evil impulses, his own inclinations, and his own desires. This is man's natural condition in the fallen state, yet Paul wrote elsewhere that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is, there is freedom. When the spirit of the Lord is, he says in 2 Corinthians 3.17, there is liberty. Now how are these two truths reconciled? How are you freed and in, in liberty yet you're under the bondage of the Lord Jesus Christ? How does that happen? Paul had learned that man is only free when he becomes a slave to Christ. Now, outside of Christ, we've noted that every man is a slave to sin. Why? Because we were born that way. When we inherited from Adam our sin nature, we were enslaved to sin. But now that we have become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, now that we have the Spirit of God living in us, we have been set free. But that freedom allows you to serve God not to stay enslaved to sin. See, our problem is, is that when we fail to realize that we have been set free to serve, and we are still living under the servitude of sin, we fail to realize the very purpose of our salvation when we do that. Paul, inciting his own credentials, 
regardless as his highest virtue, said that he was a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul understood the price that had been paid for his redemption. And for that price, Paul fully understood this, that he had a responsibility to the Lord Jesus Christ and that responsibility was to be a servant, literally a bond slave for the cause of Christ. See, he, did, he understood that there was a penalty paid for him. So often we don't fully understand the very penalty that was paid for, our, for, for you to have the right to even be sitting. Amen. Amen. We don't understand what Christ went through and understand this. That the very price that he paid, the very life that he gave was ours to give. Amen. And instead, that he stepped and took our very place so that we can have the freedom to be even called Christian. We fail to realize that. So, so often, what happens is, is that as a result and failure to understand that, we then don't take our, our faith very seriously. Amen. It's very flippant. So it's easy then to become a Christian on Sunday or in the right setting or give the appearance of, of being faithful. But faith extends itself law way beyond Sunday. Okay? Because Christ's death, Christ's payment, the penalty that was paid for our sin was a very, 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 very hefty price. Amen. Think about this. He left the realm of heaven. Amen. He left the diadem of heaven. He left the royalty of heaven. Amen. Put on sinful flesh. Amen. Became, the scripture says, like as we are, yet without sin. When he didn't have to, some of us won't leave our homes if we don't have to. He left the realm of heaven for your sake. Not for his. He didn't need it. And he died in our place. And for that, you know what we are then called to be? A slave for the Lord Jesus Christ. Understanding that you were bought with a price. And it was a heavy price that was paid. There was a hefty price that was paid for our redemption. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. And so for that reason, where Paul says that he was called to be a servant, we too are called to be servants, bond slaves for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, we are not called to be servants of men. Every pastor, every elder, every bishop, Every missionary, every evangelist is called to be a servant of the Lord. Every Christian is called to be a servant of the Lord and not a servant of men. Look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He said, for he that is called in the Lord, verse 22 and 23 of 1 Corinthians 7. He says, being a servant is the Lord's free man, likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. He says on the other hand though, be not ye the servants of men. See unfortunately hear me now. You know how you become a servant of men? Because most of us think I've served no man. Serve nobody. Oh, yes, we do. You know how we serve them? We serve them in the, in the form of MasterCard and Visa. See? We serve them in the form of a Ford Motor Credit. We serve them in the form of Coles and, and, and Macy's and, and all of the other things and, and, and Nordstrom. Hey, <laughs> See? And you know what? Some of us, whether we want to believe it or not, are in bondage. We are in shackles. Because the only thing we can serve is ourselves and our materialism. So we're in bondage to the extent that we can't afford to get God said go across the street, you couldn't go. You couldn't 
afford to go. Because you don't have the money to go. God couldn't call you anyway. Oh, we're in bondage to men. And believe me, they love it. And they come, they come and they send you a check, they send you a statement and let you know your money's due. Pay up. Or I'll come get mine. Too bad the church can't do that. <laughs> Too bad we can't send you a statement. And say, you know what, you live off us, you, you benefit from us. Right? There's a benefit that you receive here. Right? Here's your state. Pay up. Be like Crib Flow Dollar. Crib Flow Dollar got an a ATM at his church. We're not going to do that. <laughs> but Crib Flow Dollar got ATMs at his church. He's, and then, then he had a thing. Ray Bingley sent it to me. Said, he said that if, if, if you don't pay your tithe, they'll just have a gun and shoot you. What? Crib Flow Dollar said that. I, and Crypto, I know you're not going to watch this. <laughs> but it's out there on the internet. Wow. Okay. Goodness. Just go look at it. Wow. On one hand, I ain't mad at it. <laughs> but I think it's a bit much. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So this is what happens. All too often we spend our time concerned about our freedoms. Right? We fight for freedom, we stand for freedom, we demonstrate for freedom. When the reality for the believer is that we have been freed from the bondage of sin only to become a bond slave for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our freedom from sin freed us to become servants. Does that make sense? Yes. You were freed to serve. Yes. See, because here's our problem. When we were in the throes of sin, when we were in the bondage of sin, we were bound from serving. Amen. We couldn't serve God if we wanted to. We didn't serve God if we wanted to. And it's a tragedy when you get freed from sin that you are still in such bondage to your bills that you can't serve God. You're still in bondage. Failing to realize that you have been set free. Amen. Only to serve yes. the Lord. It's a tragedy. So Paul says this. We don't serve men, but we are called to serve the Lord. Every man. Every Christian is called to be a slave. Knocked down on the block. Bought and paid for by the very blood of Jesus Christ. And when such a price was paid, our only response should be to serve the Lord with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all of our soul. We should give him everything that we have, understanding the price that was paid for us. Christ gave his very life for our freedom, and our response should be that we willingly are bond slaves for the cause of Christ. In fact... If you look at how God elected to demonstrate this principle, what he did was this. The very first man in the New Testament that was saved by believing the same way that you and I believe. And in the same manner, you know who he was? He was an Hamitic slave from Ethiopia. We call him the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 8. He was born a Canaanite, a man of Hamitic origin. And for some of you who don't know what Hamitic origin, he came from the, the, the line of Ham. He was a black man from Ethiopia. God chose in his word to make him a man who had fallen under the curse of Ham of Genesis chapter 9 chose to make him the very first person in the New Testament that was freed from sin. God has a sense of humor. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take someone who is, is called, into, according to Genesis chapter 9, to be a, a servant of servants, and I'm going to use him to be the very first person that gets freed from the bondage of sin. Mm. And he chose the Ethiopian eunuch to do it. 
and he was met, and he met Philip, and Philip led him to Christ, and he was the very first man that was free. God has a sense of humor. You know what that says? Here's our problem, because that verse is used in a very racist way to, to say that a certain uh, uh, group of people are, are, are under bondage, right? Here's the reality, and never lose sight of this. All Gentiles are under bondage. Yeah. Amen. Whether you're Hamitic or you're Shemite, Amen. it doesn't matter. You're all under bondage. And until you get free by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. we're all enslaved. Yeah. It just so happens that under the Hamitic curse, then people are serving of servants. God said, then that's who I'll use to show you what can happen if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I will free you. And he freed him from the bondage of sin. Amen. Very powerful statement that the Lord did. Upon his conversion, the curse was being moved. And he left from being a servant of men to being a servant of God, which is what all of us are. Let's look at the second thing that Paul says. Paul goes on and says this, that not only was he an, a servant, but he was also an apostle. He says in the second part of verse 1, he says that he was called to be, he said first that he was a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Now first he told us that he was a servant. Now he goes on to say that as a servant, God had called him to be an apostle. And as, a, as an apostle, he had been separated unto the gospel of God. We'll look at that in just a second. Now it is unfortunate that men of God in the church today consider the pastorate to be a job, an occupation, instead of a calling. See, that's why I'm not quick to just get rid of Bible study on Wednesday. Because you know why? Because being at Bible study is not my job. I was called to be. I'm not here because I'm getting paid to be here on Wednesday. You know what it'd be easy to do then? Do what half of us do with our regular jobs. Call in sick. Yeah. Right? I, I, I believe this. If it's, if it's a day, I don't care if one of you show up. We have a church on Sunday. Yeah. I don't care if the chiefs are playing at 10. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step on this. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not here because this is my occupation, this is my job. When God, when I was birthed, I wholeheartedly believed that God knew that one day I would pastor a church. And what God did was set up the circumstances and situations in my life to give me the very testimony that I have that then allows me to be a pastor. Amen. God had a plan for me in the womb. Amen. I'm not here because this pays, because let me tell you something. It don't pay that good. <laughs> it's not that great of a, I'm telling you, this, I'm not one of the preachers of LA. I do not have a Bentley parked out back. Okay? But you know what? I'm called to do this. Amen. And you know what Paul said he was? He was called to be an apostle. Just like I'm called to pastor a church. Amen. And you're, you have a calling too. Yeah. See, this calling don't just go on pastors. We not the only, you have a calling. Your calling may not be to be a pastor. But you have a calling on your life. I guarantee you do. Whether you're ever going to realize that or not is not up to me. It's up to you. And you know what it's connected to? Your obedience. God has something for you. I guarantee you he does. Because God didn't call. He didn't save you. He didn't die on the cross. He didn't hang and bleed for nothing. 
He has a purpose. The ministry to most men is nothing more than a vocation. It's nothing more than another source of income. Some people work a job to support a call. You might not be able to live off the ministry to which God has called you, but the ministry is far more than just another job. If you're not called to do this job, you will find yourself quickly wanting to quit. It's why churches in America close up every day. You know what happens? Men get in and they think, they see the preachers of L.A. And they think that, you know, I'm going to, well, we're going to be rolling here soon. And five years later, they got ten members. And then they go, something's wrong. And then you know what they do? They move on to the next occupation. An apostle, when you look at it literally, it means one who is sent. Someone who is commissioned with the authority of the one who sent him. And Paul's claim that he was called to be an apostle in the day that he said it was dramatic and it was radical. Why? Because of this. Watch this. I'm getting ready to step on some toes here. If you read the book of Acts, you will discover that there were three stipulations to being called an apostle. So half these guys that are walking out here today calling themselves apostles, you know what's happened? They didn't want to be pastors, so they elevated themselves to bishops. Bishops wasn't good enough, so now they want to be apostles. Apostles aren't good enough either, so you know what? Soon they'll be called Christ. But let me tell you something. There were only three ways that you could even be called an apostle. Number one, the person had to be a disciple of Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. Acts chapter 1, verse 21. Secondly, he had to be an eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection. That's in verse 22 of Acts chapter 1. And then thirdly, he had to have his call from Christ himself. That's also in verse 22 of Acts chapter 1. So one of the early controversies in the church rose when Paul became an apostle. Paul was not a disciple of Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. He did not even know Jesus. Paul did not encounter Jesus at the resurrection, but only after he had ascended into heaven. So how could Paul then be an apostle? Three times in the book of Acts, Paul bears witness to the call he received, watch this, from Jesus Christ himself. The risen Savior appeared to Paul and called him to be an apostle. By far the most important credential of an apostle was that he had to have an immediate and direct call. And Paul received that when he met the Lord on the road to Damascus. Amen. God called him and called him to be an apostle. So these men that are out here calling themselves apostles, if you are part of what they're doing, then hear me. And I'm re saying this into the tape. They're crooks. Because <laughs> you can't be an apostle unless you meet the qualifications of an apostle. So if you ever get somebody in here and he says, call me apostle so-and-so, you better take them to the word of God and say, prove it. Yeah. What if somebody today claimed to be an apostle? Which men do. Amen? Amen? If somebody came in from the desert and said that they had just seen Jesus and they had been called to be an apostle, what would you say? If such a person started writing books and wanted to have them added to the New Testament, how would you respond? Couldn't a person make that kind of claim? You know who did? Joseph Smith. The father of Mormonism. And you know what he did? He said he was an apostle. You know what he did? He said, I have another testament from Jesus himself. And he wrote the Book of Mormon. And let me tell you something. There are millions of followers. 
But there was there was a whole bunch of people that followed Jim Jones too. I'll tell you now, if y'all see the, the cup the teacups lining up back here, y'all better get up. <laughs> If I, that's a, I won't be here then. <laughs> Notice that even Paul, though, in, his, in, in, in this situation, he could not begin to function as an apostle until he had been endorsed by the twelve, whose credentials were not in question. They, everyone knew that they had been picked, handpicked by Jesus. Okay? Now, although it is, theoretically it is theoretically possible that God could call a person directly today, here's the problem why they couldn't then be an, an apostle. Because they couldn't be endorsed by the twelve. Because they don't exist anymore. If you can't get them one way, you just get them another. I'm telling you, these guys that are calling themselves apostles, it, it, there is something to it. And there's a reason why God only called certain men to be apostles. And once that office was over, it was over. That is why the church attributes special importance to apostles. There were agents of revelation. In the Old Testament, God used prophets. In the New Testament, he used, he used this, uh, apostles who then gave us the word of God. The New Testament records the call of Paul to be an apostle, but he was set apart for a specific reason, for the gospel of God. And it is that gospel which the apostle sets before us now in this epistle. Paul's ministry was of a different character. He was preeminently the apostle of the Gentiles, and to him was committed the special, watch this, dispensation of the mysteries. We studied it on Wednesday night. At least we started. We, there are seven mysteries that were given to the church. You guys that were here Wednesday, we studied three of them such Wednesday night. We're going to cover the other four on, on Wednesday. Okay? Paul was the one that was given that dispensation. He was the one that God decided to use who was going to bring about these mysteries and explain to us the seven mysteries that are given to the New Testament church. You should have them in your Bible. You should know what they are. You know why? Because we're called to be stewards of the mysteries of God. And if you don't know what they are, how do you know what your stewardship is called? Amen. But these, these guys, they were New Testament apostles. They had been set apart for God. And we're studying this now. So Paul was, the, was the, 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 the apostle to the Gentiles that was committed this dispensation of the mystery. And this puts his apostleship on an altogether different plane from the twelve. They knew Christ on earth and their ministry was linked to the kingdom of heaven. But the kingdom of heaven was rejected by the nation of Israel. They instead then crucified him. And God took his message from the Jews and then gave it over to Gentiles like us. And now we have the responsibility of teaching and preaching the gospel. Of which Paul was the apostle to us. See how it works? Paul had a special calling, and we are sitting here because of his calling. Amen. He was called to reach us, a people that Jews hated, that they did not agree with, that they called us dogs. Paul said, God said, okay, Jews, since you've rejected me, the very dogs are going to be the ones that I now use to reach the masses. And the gospel came to us. That is what we're going to study in the book of Romans. It is, it is a unique thing study. Look at what Paul says also, though. The third thing he says of himself is that he was separated unto the gospel. We're still in verse 1. I told you I could literally preach on verse 1 for a week. It's that much in here. I didn't give it the justice that it really needs for the sake of time. There's some stuff in here. 
Look at what he says. He says he was separated. He was called to be a servant. He was an apostle, specific calling. But that apostleship was specific that he was separated unto the gospel. That was his call. Now, as an apostle, he was separated to the gospel. Now, what does it mean to be separated, though? In the scriptures, the word separated means to be sanctified. It means to be set apart. Paul was set apart for a specific purpose. And that purpose was to, to reach the masses with the gospel. We may rightfully think of this separation from several viewpoints. Paul had been set apart for this special ministry before his birth. The same as Moses was set apart to be the leader of the children of Israel in the Old Testament. The same that Jeremiah was called to be the prophet that would give us the part of the word of God. The same that John the Baptist was separated from his mother's womb to be the forerunner to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, too, was separated from his mother's womb. Look at what it says in Galatians chapter 1. He said, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. You know what? I was separated from my mother's womb too. So were you. The problem is that sometimes we don't figure what that separation is. God had a specific purpose for you and you only. You have your DNA. You have your fingerprints. You have your hairs. These count as the very hairs on your head. You're unique. You have your own personality. There is a reason that God made you the way that you are. <coughs> and that reason is for God's purpose, not your own. Our problem is that, you know what we do? We are working for the gold watch. We think that God separated us so that we could spend 30 years on our job, and when they're finished with us, they hand us a gold watch and then give us the 401k that we saved on our own. <laughs> and say, thank you, welcome to retirement. Now go somewhere and die. We believe that that's what life is about. That's not what life is about. God's made you who you are for a purpose. And only you are you. No one else is you. No one thinks like you. No one acts like you. No one is emotional like you. No one is no one is you. But here's the thing. It was for a purpose. You know what our job as a church is to do? Help you figure what that purpose is. So that you can live a full, fulfilled life. A life that is filled with being full of what? Of God. Amen. Not of your 401k. I'm telling you, you can retire and go get the nicest beachfront property in wherever. And you know what? One day that you're going to be laying on a gurney, looking out the window, and your kids going to be waiting for you to die so they can spend up every dime you save. Amen. Because we think that that's what life is about. And that's not what life is about. Paul had been delivered from the people of Israel and the Gentile nations for a purpose. To be a minister and witness of the things that he had both seen and heard. Paul was separated with Barnabas for the specific work of carrying the gospel to the Gentiles. When in Antioch, in Pasida, the brethren, in accordance with the divine command, you know what they did? They laid hands on them and they sent them out for one purpose, to carry the gospel message that you and I have responded to that's causing us to be here today. This is precisely what God had done in our lives. You and I have been separated from the world. And you know what he is doing? He has equipped us with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for the purpose of setting people free from the burden of sin. You know what's the first ministry you receive when you get saved? It's called the ministry of reconciliation. You know what you have the ability to do? Reconcile people back to God. The only thing you need to do is memorize a couple of verses. You know what I had the privilege of doing this morning before church even started? 
I had the privilege of taking the wind's two little boys and leading them to Christ. Amen. They trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know what happened to, the, to, to, to uh, Rashid's wife? Uh, no, I'm forgetting your name. Aubrey, Lord Jesus. And I know, I, you know I know. I had the privilege of spending some time with Aubrey on the phone today. Aubrey's grandmother is very sick. We need to keep her lifted up in prayer. But Aubrey called me, and you know what I had the opportunity to do this week? Share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with her. And you know what Aubrey, what Aubrey did this week? She trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. You know why? All of us should be doing it. That's not my job. That's your job. I'm called to be the shepherd. You know what the shepherd doesn't do? Produce sheep. Sheep produce sheep. But you know what? I'm a sheep of the Lord, so I still get to produce sheep too. Amen. But you know what? All of us are called. Paul said, my job is to give to you the message of the gospel. You know what your job then is to do? Share it with everybody you go. So you know what? There, we don't have, this is not our temple, this building. They can tear this building down. We want church this week. Yeah. Why? Because this is where the people of the church. You're the church. You know what you are? The temple of the Holy Spirit of God. You know what that means? You can share the gospel at Ford, at, at the airport, at wherever you go. You get to take the message of the gospel, and you get to share it with whomever, and whenever, and wherever, and it doesn't matter. You can lead somebody to Christ in McDonald's. Because it has nothing to do with this building. And you have the message. You're the person that received the gospel. The only thing you got to do is share with somebody what you believe. Amen. If you believe. <coughs> the gospel here is called the gospel of God. In verse 9, we see it called the gospel of his son. And in verse 16, it's going to be called the gospel of Christ. But regardless to what it is called, it is the gospel, watch this, that is the very power unto salvation. It is the gospel that separates lost people from saved people. It is the gospel that is the very death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that is the mandate for all who believe. You know why? Because it is the gospel that has separated us. We are sanctified by the gospel. It is what makes us new creatures created in Christ Jesus. Paul said that the mandate of the gospel had separated him. And if you and I are ever going to be effective for the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to be willing, watch this, to burn all of our bridges. It's a hard thing for people. It's the very thing that most people never get past. If you're going to be effective for God, there's some things you've got to give up. We cannot be willing to compromise when it comes to Christ and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ must de dominate every aspect of our life. So you know what Paul mandated to the church in Corinth? Look at what he said in 2 Corinthians 6. That this is what he's told us to do. He says, be ye not unequally yoked together with what? Unbelief. He said, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? You know what? You know what the answer is? None. <laughs> he says, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? You know what Belial is? The devil. He said, and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You know what the answer is? None. He says, and what agreement had the temple of God with idol? He says, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Look at what he goes on to say in verse 17. He says this, and here's a command. He says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye what? He said, be separate, saith the Lord. And do what? He said, touch not the... Look at what he calls lost people. He calls
calls them unclean things. He says, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. There ought to be a difference between us and lost people. Amen. You know what our problem is? We don't want to burn the bridge. Yeah. Oh, we want to, we, what we want to do is be saved. Right? What's that song say? I'm going to stay saved. I'm right? We want to be saved, but we still want to be able to cross that bridge. So what we do is that we'll not cross the bridge down, but we'll keep a step or two. So we can go back whenever we get ready. Right? So we want to, we want to, we, this is what we want to do. We want to come to church on Sunday and amen and shout and do all the things that we do. But then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, see, we want to keep, you know, hey, what's up, man? Right? We want to keep our little internet. Right? We want to keep our little books. We want to keep our little phone numbers. We want to keep our little life that's here, mm -hmm. that we think nobody <coughs> does to know. Why? Because we want, cause we're not willing to be separated. Amen. Amen. We want to keep a link. Sometimes it's in a, it, 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 it's hidden deep in our little. Uh, my wife can't can't get in my phone. <laughs> Cause I got I got two I got I got I got two uh, email addresses. Come on now. <coughs> you know I'm telling the truth. Paul said that we should be separated from the world, but a Christian should not just be separated. Watch this from something. We primarily watch this must be separated to something. See, it's one thing to separate myself from my friends. It's one thing to be separated from the world. But watch this. You can cut off all your friends. You can get rid of the, 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 the secret phone numbers. You can get make sure that you're transparent in everything that you do. Amen. Watch Amen. this. But if you're not separated to something, it's easy to go back. Amen. So you keep the breathing. Paul said, I'm not just separated from the world, I'm separated to the gospel. Amen. Our problem is that we don't want to be separated to something. Separated from something means we quit drinking, we quit smoking, we quit dancing, we get rid of the TV shows, we don't go to see certain movies, we get rid of beer, we get rid of alcohol, we get rid of tobacco, and don't hang on to any of them. See, that separates me from something. But unless you're separated to something, your separation from those things doesn't amount to anything. Amen. There are many people who don't do this and don't do that, but although they are separated from things, they need to turn from being separated to being separated to something. Amen. What are you separated to? Paul was separated, he said, unto the gospel. Let me ask you this question. Are you separated unto the gospel? Is the death, burial, and resurrection so, so dominant in your life that you are so separated to it that it motivates everything that you do? How has the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ impacted your life? And on a daily basis, how does the finished work that was done on Calvary determine your direction for life? How has what Christ did on Calvary impacted you so that as a result of its work, you impact the lives of other people? Are you separated two people outside of this church? Come on now. Some of us, to, I, I'm telling you, I can invite everyone, I, and we do it, right? I say, watch y'all come over and watch the game. People be like, man, look, I really would love to watch the game at your house, but I can't drink over there. <laughs> and how are you going to watch the Chiefs play Denver without a beer? <laughs> and then after that, we're going to go outside and twist one up. Come on now, you think, you, think, you think it ain't happening? You think I'm ignorant to that? Amen. 
Amen. You think I'm stupid Amen. today? You think I'll do you think everybody in here is just holy and holy you know, and sanctified? Come on now. <laughs> I'm not stupid, but here's the deal. You gotta keep coming so you can learn how to be separated. Amen. Amen. Right? I don't expect for you to walk in here separated. I don't expect Aubrey just got saved. Aubrey now she got it. It doesn't work that way. Amen. But you know what? You're never going to be separated if you keep being separated. Some of us won't give ourselves over to be separated. We show up, if you, and I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you show up here on Sunday and you get the hour and a half that I give you a week, you're not separated. Quit fooling yourself. That ain't enough. It ain't enough for me. It ain't enough for you. It takes time to learn how to walk this walk. Amen. Some of us are so separated to our friends that we don't want to be separated from them. And if you're not separated from your friends, so let me tell you something. There's some people, the minute you get saved, you need to give them up. They ain't no good for you. They will destroy you. You quit twisting. Now you twisting again. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I ain't talking about twerking either. <laughs> Here's the second thing. There's the message of the gospel. And we're going to finish with these last two verses. Now Paul goes now into verses 2 and 4. 2, two, two 3 and 4. Okay? And what he does is this. He goes into this parenthetical phrase. And he identifies the gospel with the glad tidings that are promised in the Old Testament. And it was promised by the prophets in the scriptures. Now the Lord did this. He made a promise of the gospel of God by the prophets in the Old Testament. See, the gospel is not just a New Testament concept. It was talked about in the Old Testament. The gospel, watch this though. The, when you became a Christian, and you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the gospel is not a new law. It's not a code of morals and ethics that we're called to live by. It's not a creed that ex was accepted by men. It's not a system of religion that we adhere to. It's not good advice that we should follow. Instead, you know what it is? It is, it is a divinely given message concerning a divine person, the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a message of good news that when sin was passed on to every man that enters this world through the human birth, that God promised a way <coughs> through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for moral man that you could be born again. Amen. I told the kids today. You know what's next? Why it was next? Why Jesus had the conversation with John in, in John chapter three about with Nicodemus. You know why he told Nicodemus you must be born again because something's wrong with our first birth. You know what's wrong with our first birth? We were born in the image and likeness of a fallen sinner, Adam. And what was the problem? Was that Adam, because of him, passed sin on to us. What's the problem with having, so what, I'm a sinner? The problem with it is that there's a penalty for it. Yeah. What's the penalty? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to die. Right. Can't guarantee you anything. I can't guarantee you that the Chiefs going to win tonight. But I can guarantee you, you live long enough, you're going to die. Yeah. And some of us are living for the Chiefs. Ain't want to tell you. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I'm telling you, these people not at church today because they get ready for the 730 game. Oh, yeah. You think it is? Do you think it's not? Get, get full! <laughs> At 11.15 in the morning. <clears throat> God provided a way for us to be redeemed. Because without Christ, without the gospel, there was no way for redemption. That was the problem. We would have had to die in our sin. <clears throat> and the only thing he could do with our body, see, because even at the rapture, you don't take this. 
is to put it, so there are going to be a bunch of corpses there, right? But th th is to take it and bury it and let it rot because it's the only thing it's good for. So that's why he said you must be born. Yeah. Something's wrong with this body. I just got a new head. Something's wrong with this body. People in here have suffered from cancer. Something's wrong with this body. Some of us have ailments right now. You know, it's good when you're young. You think, I'm young, I can do this and that. And all of a sudden, you get a new hip. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Yeah. It don't, and it don't take long, does it? Mm -hmm. you, know, you, get a little, you live a little while, you know what I'm talking about. It don't take long. <laughs> See, I'm telling you, life is very short. Mm -hmm. And the sin that was passed on to us because of Adam causes the body to decay. Mm -hmm. So God gives you so much time to figure out the gospel. And either you figure it out, or you know what? The only thing you have to look forward to is the gold watch. That's it. The only thing you have to afford to look to is your retirement. And then I'm telling you, if that don't last, and your kids is waiting for you to retire too. Uh, and, but they don't want you to just retire from the job, they want you to retire. <laughs> So that they can live off your retirement. I'm telling you, it's a vicious cycle. It's just a vicious cycle. So God gives you so many years to figure this thing out. And you know what? We are equipped with the thing that we should be telling everybody we know. How to get out of this cycle. It's what we're called to do. We're the ones who have the message. We have the answer. We do what we have the answer. And we should be telling our neighbors, our cousins, our friends, everybody we know how to get out of this. Because the only thing they have for to look forward to, I'm telling you, is the gold watch. And most people don't get 30 years on the job anymore, so there ain't nobody even looking for retirement anymore. It's hard to get there. Can't anybody work for UPS for 30 years like that? <laughs> The glorious, this being that Christ was, watch this, and we're going to finish. He, he was 100% truly man, yet he was 100% God. Amen. He is the branch that grew out of the root of David, therefore he is truly man. But he is also the son of God, the virgin born, who had no human father. And this his works of power were de demonstrated. To this blessed fact, the spirit of holiness bear witness, watch this, when he raised Jesus from, to, from the dead. Because, watch this, the gospel is important. <coughs> it's the death burial of Jesus Christ. But you know what's the real kicker? The resurrection. It wasn't just the death and burial of Jesus Christ. It was the fact that he defeated death. That really makes the our story what it is. See, many men have died for other men. There are men in Afghanistan dying for our sins right now. So it's not, you know, because so when you ask someone, they'll say, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sin. So did uh, Corporal so and so. He died for your sin too, or the sin of this country. So dying for your sin is not so special. Well, I believe that he was buried. And here's the thing. It wasn't just his burial. Because there are many men who have died and buried for other men. Watch this. It wasn't just his resurrection either. There were other men who had, Was Lazarus not resurrected? Why not Lazarus then? You know what the difference in Jesus Christ's resurrection was? He never died again. Praise the Lord. Lazarus died again. Mm -hmm. Jairus' daughter. Mm -hmm. Jesus, remember, Jesus raised her from the dead. Mm -hmm. She died again. But you know, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection to never die again of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That is where our power is. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? You have to understand that. Otherwise, you know what you'll go through saying? I believe Jesus died for my sin. He did die for your sin. He died for the sin of the whole world. But that doesn't mean that the whole world accepts. Yeah. 
the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for the, the people, the sinners out there too. Yes, he did. He died for them. So, Christ is the heart of the gospel message. Paul set himself before us a threefold way. Watch this. First of all, he is the resurrected one. Look at verse 2. Here's the parenthetical phrase. It says, which he had promised afford by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. It was Paul's special calling to take the things of Christ as they were out in the Old Testament and explain them in light of what happened on Calvary. Now there are three great truths or mysteries that Paul then was given, and these mysteries were part of the Old Testament. We'll go through these, but we'll look at them. The pattern is given here. It's given in 2 Timothy 3.16. He says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, we have the, people say the Bible is a book written by men. It was. But they were inspired by God. Okay? It says it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. The first book that Paul wrote was Romans. Okay? Romans is the mystery of Christ's cross. Now I'm writing, you want you to write this in your notes for reference. Okay? First and second Corinthians then gives a reproof because it shows what happens when there's moral failure in a church. And Galatians is the book that Paul wrote for correction. It shows when there is doctrinal error. Secondly is the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is the mystery of Christ's church. He wrote Philippians, which is reproof shows practical failure, and he wrote the book of Colossians, which is correction, which shows doctrinal error. But then he wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, which shows the mystery of Christ's coming. Guys, we are going through these three mysteries on Wednesdays. Any of you are welcome to attend. These mysteries were all new revelations, yet none of them are inconsistent with what God revealed already in the New Testament. God revealed the cross, the church, and the coming, again, of the Lord, and they were hidden in types and shadows in the Old Testament, but now God used the Apostle Paul to reveal them in the New Testament. And they're in those books, and they were mysteries. Before we leave verse 2, though, it's important to note that Paul calls the Word of God the Holy Scripture. Now, the Word of God or the Holy Bible, as we know it as a book of scriptures, were written down from the mouths of the holy prophets or holy men of God who spake of they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is what he says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. He says, for the prophecy, the word of God, came not in old time by the will of man. In other words, men didn't write the Bible. But what happened? Holy men of God spake or wrote the scriptures, how? As they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Scriptures are not like the Holy Quran. And I say that because I was a Muslim at one time. The Holy Quran was written by a man whose final prayer says that God told them to kill all the Jews and the Christians. There's a big gulf between the Bible and the Quran. Amen? Because the Bible is truly holy. Okay? These are sacred books. But Paul called the Bible as it is a truth, the Holy Scriptures. Here's the second thing about the Gospel. In the gospel, okay, Christ is now also the reigning one. Let's look at verse 3. He says this, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now the New Testament and begins and ends with a reference, watch this, to Jesus Christ as the son of David. Look at what it says in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. It says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I don't want you to miss this, okay? And this is what it says in the very last book of the Bible, Revelation 22. He says, he says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. And then he says of himself, 
I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, the messianic line was exhausted in Christ. Using the various genealogies of the Old Testament, both Matthew and Luke trace his rightful claim to the throne of David. If you know anything about the Bible, you know that Jesus, Jesus was separated. He had to come to the throne through the line of David, or he would not have been Messiah. Everyone knew that. Everyone knew that of him. Okay? Now, it is significant that at Calvary, no one cared about what Isaiah had wrote when he said he declared his generations. But to have so, they would have had to publicly proclaim that Jesus is so right to the throne of David. So Jesus was, in fact, the king of the Jews. But this is what it is. Watch this. And you don't miss this. Positionally, Christ is the seed of David, but personally, he is still Jesus Christ our Lord. And although the world may deny him his throne right as the seed of David, you and I as believers have a duty to call him Lord and Christ. Right. So Paul said that Jesus Christ was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. In other words, Christ was truly man. He hungered like me and you did. He thirsted like me and you did. He was tired. He had to go to sleep just like me and you did. He wept just like me and you did. He suffered. He bled. And he died just like me and you. Why? Because he was 100% man Amen. of the seed of David. Okay? That all came through David's man. Why? Because Christ was 100% was man. But then again, look at what the verse says in verse... Uh, three and four. It says that he was made of the seed of David. Do you know what that means? He was made, he was not David's seed, but he was made of the seed of David. You know why? Because God cursed the throne of David in Jeremiah chapter 22. Watch this. And you better write this down in your notes so you never have to come back to it. In Jeremiah 22, 28, it says this. Is this man, Coniah, a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel where are no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out? He and his seed are cast into a land which they know not. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. Why? For no man of his seed shall prosper. How? Sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more of Judah. You know what he said? He cursed the seed of David so that no man sitting on the throne in the seed of David <coughs> could ever have the throne of God. And you know what? David's seed proceeded no farther. So here's the thing with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, then, because of that, had to be made of a virgin. He couldn't come through David's line. Because David's line was cursed in Jeremiah chapter 22. So you know what? Here's the thing. You know, who was, you know what made him the son of David? Mary. Mary. Mary came through the line of Nathan the prophet. So Mary was of the seed of David, and she had the seed of a man in her, which came from God, and as a result of that, Jesus Christ could then rightfully be the son of David. Through Mary, not through Joseph, because Joseph never had sex with Mary. Don't miss that. The king's seed didn't come forward. So you know what he is then? Paul goes on to say this, that he is the resurrected one. Watch this. He says in verse 3 that he's of the seed of David, but he said in his, but he's declared in verse 4 to be the son of God with power. How could he be both? How could he be of the seed of Mary? He was of the seed of David through Mary, but he was declared to be of the seed of God himself. Amen. Why? Because Mary got pregnant by God. Amen. 
Amen. According to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In other words, Jesus was declared to be the son of God. He's not talking about the literal seed of David. As far as the flesh is concerned, Christ is born of Mary. Mary came through the line of David. The lineage is then traced through Mary. Mary is from David through the prophet Nathan, the son of David, because Nathan was David's son. And Jesus Christ is made of a woman. Look at what it says in Galatians 4. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, how? Made of a woman, made under the law. The woman was from David's seed. So Jesus Christ was made of the seed of the woman without being David's seed. Does, did, am I making sense? Mm -hmm. His physical life was connected with David, but spiritually, you know who he was? He was the son of God. That's who he was. He was declared to be the son of God, it says, with power. How? By the resurrection of the dead. It was the resurrection of the dead that set him apart. So Paul goes on from saying that Jesus Christ was made of the seed of David, but he does not say that he was the son of David. Instead, he calls him the son of God. In other words, the resurrection is proof of the virgin birth. You know why? Because if Jesus had been of the line of David, you know what would have happened to him? He would have stayed dead. Because David was just a man. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 29 and, 30, and verse 31. It says, and he said, men of brethren, let me speak to you of the, patri uh, you of the patriarch David. That he is what? He is both what? He dead. And he's buried. And his sepulcher is with us. Until this day, they even know where his bones are. He, he seen this, therefore spake of the resurrection of Christ. Why? That his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Why? Because he was not of the seed of David. He did not come through David's life. This may be a little bit much. Hang on. If all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is probable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. Why? That the man of God might be perfect, do he furnish on all the rest. All of, here's the whole kicker. Jesus Christ, the resurrection of, from the dead, is what gives us what we have. Jesus Christ did not come through the line of David, even though he was the son of David, through Mary. Jesus Christ was the son of God. Now, we studied this on Wednesday. You know what's unique about that? He's not just the son of God. Son he of is God. Yeah. Got to get that or you'll never get the Trinity. Yeah. Because he is God the Father, Son, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. <coughs> you know why we have a hard time understanding that? Because we think that three can't be one. You know what our problem is? You're through. You know what you got? A body, a soul, and a spirit. Those three make one. Without, if you remove one of the three, you don't exist. <coughs> now, if I went into detail about that, God makes everything in three. You know what the, the, the earth is made of? Land, sea, and air. You remove one, you don't have earth. You know what a molecule is made of? What, 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 protons, neutrons, and electrons. You know what? Those three are one. You remove a proton, a neutron, or an electron, guess what you don't have? An atom. See, we can understand it that way, but when it comes to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we go, oh, that's not right. That doesn't make sense. How can Jesus be Father? How can God be Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and God the Father? You know why? Because three make up one all day, every day. In everything that we do. That's the way it works. But we don't understand it when it comes to God. Oh, that's God. You know, there's three things I don't talk about. Politics and religion. Okay. 
<laughs> so that's all David was trying to point out in that portion of the scripture. Okay? So you know what? Paul says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that the resurrection proves he is not Joseph's son. If he were Joseph's son, he would have died. Okay? He, he would be dust and he would be in a tomb just like David. Okay? You know why? Look at what it says in Because here's our problem. If he were Joseph's son, he would not have come up because none of Adam's children come up. You know what it says in 1 Corinthians 15? Because in Adam all died. And you know what all of us were? When, why we must be born again? We're all in Adam. So you know what God says that you need to be? In Christ. Because if you're not in Christ, you're not saved. You know why? You're still in Adam. You know what the problem with Adam is? The resurrection don't mean nothing to you. And one day when I get resurrected up out of here, Guess what? If you're still in Adam, you're not going to be with me. I guarantee you if we had church today, it'd still be, and the, and the rapture happened right this minute, there'd still be enough people here to, finish, to have benediction. <laughs> it is. I didn't call it. So here it is. True Christianity is not built on the teachings of Christ. It's built on the death, burial, and resurrection. This is what it says, and we're, we're done, in Romans 10. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Yes. Why? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know what I did with, those, with, with Aubrey? You know what I did with them two boys today? You know what I shared with them? The fact that they were born in the image and likeness of Adam. And in Adam, all died. You know what I shared with them? The fact that sin had been passed on in them from Adam, and the penalty for that sin is that they're going to die. But you know what else I shared with them? The fact that Jesus Christ had come. And when it was their penalty to be paid, he paid the penalty for them. Praise the Lord. And that the only thing they have to do is confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in their heart that this happened, that he died, buried, and rose again, resurrected from the dead, to die no more. And th th you know what God did? He made it so simple that said, that's all it takes to get saved. Now, living for God, that's a whole other subject. We're not talking about living for God. We're talking about saved. Anybody can say it. It takes a few minutes. I led them boys in took five minutes. They were saved. It doesn't take but that long to get saved. How long does it take for a man to impregnate a woman? <laughs> huh? We don't even know, do we? But it takes it's pretty quick, isn't it? You know what? That's how long it takes to that it takes that a second to make to have a physical birth. It takes a second to have a spiritual birth. Now here's the difference. Once a girl gets pregnant with a baby, once she has it, it's a whole other story when the baby pop out. Because it's a big, big difference raising it. And you know where most of us screw up? We don't screw up making them. We screw up training them. Same thing happens with Christians. There's a bunch of people that are saved. Or there's a bunch of people that think that salvation is a little bit harder, and they don't realize that it happens just like that. So they never get saved because they think that's just too easy. It's that easy. Right? Now, taking a Christian and raising them from infancy to maturity, that takes a lot. You people that are discipling people, that's not that easy. I'm looking for some of y'all babies today <laughs> that y'all disciple. Where are they this morning? If, if I give you a disciple, you better be watching your baby. If your baby don't show up to church, I'm probably going to come to you. Amen, some of you people that are raising babies. And some of you are going to be giving disciples. Where's your baby? <coughs> if they ain't at church, who's training them? Their boyfriends, their girlfriends? Come on, man. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we